So here we go, changing our world, problems we encounter. I hope out of this series that we see that it is God's people that must put in motion a spiritual awakening that will radically change the moral landscape of our culture. Spiritual revival in the church brings social reform to the culture. Only can a spiritual awakening rescue us from our nation's darkness. We will not be able to find our way back unless God brilliantly shines the light upon our dark culture. I will say this here and I will repeat it later. The future of America lies at the door of the church in America. I sense the certainty of that and the church of the past will not remotely be the church for America's future. I want to say that again because that doesn't go over real well. The church of the past will not remotely be the church for America's future. Beloved, we can't stand another decade uh, of lukewarm Christians and indifferent churches. For an awakening to happen, we immediately must confront at least three very real problems. A pulpit problem, a past problem, and we talked about those the last time. And for those of you that was brave enough to come back or tune in this Sunday, I'm glad you're here to hear about our pew problem. You didn't want the sniffles, did you? Huh? Larry Stocksteel writes, and I quote, America has become so dysfunctional that it could be characterized as a post-Christian society. He does say this, not me. The bed hopping, drug crazed, multiple marriage family has produced what some psychiatrists are calling flatliners. People with no feelings because they have been hurt so much. People with no feelings, people whose hearts are stone. Many youth have approached, he says, this status. And as a result, it takes more and more stimulation to even evoke compassion within them, end of quote. American Christianity, we see this. Our heart breaks and we long to help. Yet so far, we have only offered a more refined version of ourself and what we know and what we've done. We've just kept doing the same thing but it's a refined version of what we've been doing and who we were. Is there a shortage of Christian speaking uh, the message of Christ? Probably not. But there is a sparsity of people seeing the image of Christ. Someone said, preach and use words if you have to. Here's another quote by Stocksteel. There are basically three levels of participation in every church. He says, attenders, members, and multipliers. The multipliers are the ones who would qualify as disciples, New Testament disciples. We have attenders and we have members. But the severity of our pew problem is we have way too few multipliers, New Testament disciples. Someone said, build a church, build a church, and you will rarely get disciples. Make disciples, and you will always build the church. The American church in the 21st century is so addicted to ourselves that Christ isn't seen in us. This is why people are not seeing Jesus in me and you. They are seeing me and you. Because we are so caught up in ourselves. As long as me is my idol, 
We will not become New New Testament disciples. The mandate Jesus gave for a disciple is to deny yourself. Therefore, we must forsake our self-intoxicating ways of doing life our way. Jeremiah describes Christianity in America, and he, sw- and he says, My people have committed two sins or two evils. They have forsaken me. That's one of them. The spring of the living water. And here's the other one. And they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Beloved, we have taken him off the throne, and we have put ourselves on the throne. Denzel Washington said this in an interview in 2019, and I quote, The real enemy is the inner me. He says, the Bible says in the last days, and and he goes ahead, he says, Now, I don't know that it's the last days. It's not my place to know. But it says that we will be lovers of ourselves. Think about it. The number one photograph today is a selfie. (laughs) Well, that just got us all, didn't it, huh? Follow me. Look at me. Listen to me. Don't offend me. What about me? Got to take care of me. Don't bother me. And on goes my list of self-absorbed suggestions about me. My personal well-being. If it is the foundation of my thinking, me is the driving force of my decisions. And in order for spiritual renewal to come to our churches, me must take a back seat to he. Yes, spirit-filled preaching and teaching has been a scarcity to challenge the me mentality. Come on, amen. Think about, think about our history. Think about our preaching Listen to the average sermon and the average teaching and you will soon hear there are those resounding words that encourages me that's just got to be me. And today, the Holy Spirit is saying, I want you to preach so me is repented of and is denied and so he is revered on his throne in my life. That's how I want you to preach. That's how I want my people to live and to follow me. Jesus Christ being the me. Again, there is a pew. People in pews are are not ready to recover. Think about this. People in pews are not ready to recover from the me addiction. And I wonder... If God isn't forming a national context, I just wonder. Didn't hear anything from the Lord on this. Just wonder. I wonder if God is not forming a national context that will spur us toward repenting of the me mentality. Back several years ago, and I do mean several, James Robison wrote in an article warning America. He says that America is either moving toward humility or humiliation. He suggested that our sins has brought us to a place where God is shaking our nation in radical ways. There are those who just feel like that God is up to something. Now I want you to listen. Maybe the signs we see in our country are end time precursors or maybe they are better times producers. Thank you, five that clapped. I told you all about that stuff. I understand, maybe this is, maybe Jesus is just getting us ready for the end all, the consummation of the age where heaven and earth passes away and that's the end and he comes back. Maybe he is, but maybe what we're seeing is getting, they are going to produce 
They're going to produce some better times. And the reason they're going to produce some better times is because we're living and maybe moving into a national context that causes me to repent because I look what me has done to me country. And me has not done good for me country. But I repent of me and I revere he. Maybe, maybe that's what God is up to. It is a better time producer. And I'm going to tell you when his people on this earth humble themselves and they seek his face and they pray and they turn from their me ways, come on, amen. When they turn away from me being on the throne, he'll forgive our sin and he'll heal our land. And you talk about good times. Ah. So the next time somebody says to you, is this the precursor for end times? And you say, it could be. Ah, but it also could be the producer of better times. We get to see revival and an awakening come to our nation. But I know this. It is a sign that God is up to something. Beloved, there's something There's something in the air. Now, Marty, if you don't want me to pick on you, get off that front seat. That's all I'm saying. I I said, Pastor Marty and I. Brother Brother Marty and I were talking yesterday. You just sense there is something. Huh? And I'm not not going to try to take off and, and nail down what that something is, but I'm telling you, God is up to something. And you and I get to be a part of it. Don't disregard. There could be an awakening that is coming that will revive churches. Now listen. And there is, it is impossible for an awakening to come and revive churches and the society not be reformed. Ever history, ever ever place that you see where there was a where there God did something that was unprecedented, it always brought a reform. Not everybody gets revived, but you better hear this: everybody is affected because some people got revived. Is God using our times of national adversity to get His people repentive? Ready? There's a word. Turn to your neighbor and say, did he say repentive ready? Did he say repentive ready? So from what I'm seeing in American Christianity as of right now, we are not uh, so, so repentive ready. But I do believe that we're closer now than before. Those of you that are familiar with addiction know that usually addicts, in order for them to come to the end of themselves before they seek the path of recovery, I've heard it frequently referred to as rehab ready. We say, you know, what? Should, so should we try to get him in an inpatient rehab or her in an inpatient rehab? And, and so people that make those decisions and are working with them, they, they, they refer to, I don't know what they refer to it, but I've heard it referred to as, but maybe they're not rehab ready. Maybe we haven't humbled ourselves and are repentive ready. But national humiliation, (laughs) oh, national humiliation will put us in a context that we might be pretty repentive ready. Or at least, so what do you base that on? Well, I, I can tell you this. So when Israel would turn away from God and God would send a judge, God would send a prophet, God would send a messenger calling them to to tear down the altars of Baal and erect uh, altars for the worship of Jehovah, and they would not. They went on in their own uh, perniculous and, and disobedient ways. And so what God did was God created the context for uh, Israel humiliation. In comes a oppressive 
country, a oppressive tribe that just oppresses them. And guess what they do? They get repentive ready. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, and they repent and they come back to God. And yep, give them about 40 years and they're back at it again. Well, so again, repentive ready. Some suggest that we, the people of God, if we don't humble ourselves of our own choosing, we will suffer unprecedented national humiliation. And again, I'm not prophetic. Nothing about that's prophetic. Uh, and I'm even skeptical of those self-professed uh, prophets who uh, proposed and do so for selling books and gaining the following. I am skeptical, so it's not prophetic, okay? But, but you do need to see this red flag of warning so Christianity in America will see the well-being of our nation lies at our doorstep, not 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, but rather 1000 East Brown Avenue, not the state house, but the church house. Here it is. Here it is. And this thing is laying at my door and your door. It's laying at our door. He said, what do you want me to do, pastor? I want you to repent. Now, some of you, listen, some of you will give more money, and that's good. Give it. Some of you will pray harder, keep praying. Some of you will read your Bible more, keep reading, in order to camouflage God with his thumb in your back saying, Confess your me mentality that you've been living by and repent of that and make me, he, the throne of your life. It's interesting how we will try our best. You know what that is? That is just more religious stuff piled on. I truly believe the hardest thing, somebody says the hardest thing a Christian has to do is forgive others. Boy, that's way up there, amen? But I got one better than that one. The hardest thing that a Christian has to do is surrender me. Our national turnaround lies at the door of the church and Jesus is standing at the door knocking and if we'll open the door, he will come in and sup with us and we with he. There are those pastors and church leaders that have the vision to open the door of the church and get him in here. We have got to get, we have got to turn him loose in here on us so he will turn on out there through us. <laughs> Listen, let me say that again. We have got to turn him loose in here on us so he will turn on out there through us. He will not, he, we may do so, we may be busy out there. But folks, people need to see more than a shell of the Christian community. They need to sense and know that the real deal is driving in that shell. And that's the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And that what keeps the Holy Spirit from working in our lives is that's me mentality. Do I need to say more than just simply say this? God said this. If my people will, I will. The pulpit of American Christianity must first fix its problems, but the pew problem must be open to a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. We must repent and become the servant, and he must be revered and become the Lord. I, I don't know what God is going to do in the future. But I do know God down through history, and I told you about when uh, Jehovah's worship was uh, diluted with paganism, what he did. Do we understand? Listen up. Do we understand our national vulnerability? This is not about doomsday. Come on, amen. This is about the day. This ain't about doomsday. No, 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 no. You say, well, yes, this is doomsday. No, 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 beloved. This is the day. This is the day we live in. Do we understand our national vulnerability? Even the secularists agree we are one blast, one germ, one market turn away from collapse. 
Do we have any clue as to how fragile the American chain of survival has become? So what are you trying to do, Pastor? I'm just trying to say, gang, we, are, we could very well be on the cusp of national humiliation, but we might be able to avoid that. How? If we would correctly assess the state of our Christian apostasy and cry out in volitional humility, repent in contrition, and seek his mercy for our land, it would be healed. And we might be able to avoid a national humiliation. Let me give you an Old Testament example of why I believe our country's survival lies at the doorstep of this church and every church in America. The Genesis account gives us written details of God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, and most preachers say that it was because homosexuality was unashamedly present, and I'm not going to argue that, but there is something more that I am certain of. There is something that is more concrete than that, because God, uh, what caused God to destroy the a city than just what was there, sin it was because of what wasn't there, righteousness. Now let's listen. Genesis chapter 18, beginning with verse 26. So the more concrete reason that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah was not just what was there, sin. It was there. Actually, it was more about what wasn't there, righteousness. Hear the word of the Lord. And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Boy, walking in the light as he is in the light, being surrendered to him, Following him in obedience carries a far greater punch with the Almighty than you and I can even imagine. Hear that word again. If I can find 50 righteous, I will spare the whole city for their sake. Well, as you know, the conversation between Abraham and God went on. And since Abraham wasn't optimistic about finding 50, he went to 40, and then he went to 30, and then he went to 20, and finally, here's what he said, and it was agreed upon. Verse 32 of uh, Genesis 18. Then he said, oh, look, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again, but this once. In other words, this is it, Lord. Suppose 10 are found there. And he answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy Keep in mind, in this dialogue between Abraham and God, there is no mention as to how many unrighteous were in Sodom. It doesn't matter the most. Oh, I think it matters, but listen. It doesn't matter the most how sinful and wicked the world gets or the increase of their number. If anything earthly influences God's decision, it's how righteous and holy that his people are. This is why our nation's future is laying at the doorstep of houses of worship. This is why I think there are many Christian leaders who have almost an unbearable sense of urgency for the church to repent and be revived. This is why I think some leaders are using desperate, unprecedented measures for an awakening to happen. Is because we see this thing is lying at our door. It's on me, and it's on you. And we all know the clock is ticking, and time is running out. Of course, our nation has a sin problem, yet it is our church's sin problem that is the greater problem. Wickedness has been the state of our world since the fall, but it was wickedness among Israel, God's people, that brought judgment. God isn't counting how many are not his. He already knows about the 99 but he is counting how many are his. If you can find 10 righteous. You think God is counting those showing up for the gay march in West Liberty? Maybe. 
But I certainly think he is counting those that show up at the house to worship him in Bell Fountain. God is saddened that they're gathering to march, but he is even more saddened that his people are not gathering to worship. They sin because they can't help but sin. Do you understand that? People sin that are in sin, that are lost, they sin because it's their nature to sin and they've never been born again with a new capacity that helps them to follow righteousness and not sin. So they are doing the only thing they can do, sin. But beloved, you and I have a nature within us when we were born again that gives us a capacity to not sin. Now, who is most culpable there, them or us? In Logan County's churches, morality is missing. Therefore, immorality is present in our family. Love is missing in our churches. Therefore, hate is present in our community. When light is not shining in the church, darkness envelops neighborhoods. Salt is not found in Christians. Therefore, decay is found in the culture. Truth is not being preached in our pulpits. Error is believed in our pews. Surrender is not mentioned among the saints, and rebellion is rampant among the sinners. It concerns us that gays are gathering under the banner of a rainbow. It ought to concern us more that our churches aren't gathering to worship under the banner Jehovah Sidkenu, which is God my righteousness. God isn't calling the country back to him. He's calling the church, Christianity in America, back to him. And guess what? When the church comes back to him, the country will follow. Growing up on the farm, come on, gang, we raised beef cattle. My dad usually had 60, 70, sometimes 80 head, my dad and my grandfather together on the, on the farms. And, and we would change frequently through the summer and the fall. We would change from one pasture to another. And we didn't ride horses to herd them. We didn't use ATVs to move them. We just put a rope on what we called the bell cow and the other 75 followed. I promise you, this works. Did you ever think this church might be the bell cow for Logan County churches? I don't know. I don't know. Does this explain why the enemy is relentlessly attacks against you and your families that attend this church? I'm telling you, I know you all are taking a hit. Come on, amen. Mm -hmm. Does the enemy know something that we don't know? I can tell you this, only God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit is omniscient. They know everything, but the enemy knows a lot. Uh-huh, come on, amen. And I don't even want to get into how he finds out, but that's another story. But he knows a lot. Is God up to something in our country? But is God up to something at 1000 Brown Avenue? Are we the bell cow? Are we going to be the folk who bow in submission? Trust me, you've got some rank wild steers in this 6070 head, huh? And you've even got some crazy cows in this 6070 head. You got the old bell cow. And my daddy just walks up to her. She just stands there. She just stands there. And my daddy walks up to her, standing in the pasture. He walks up to her and he just puts the, fixes the noose, puts it on her, makes a halter, 
And he just starts walking. And she just follows. And here comes, here comes 60, 70, ever how many there were, just following. We go across the river. He crosses. We go across. Not, 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 it's not a deep river. It's not the Ohio River, by the way. Okay. It's, it's Red River. It's, and in the summertime, it's probably about ankle deep in, in places or maybe knee. We go across the river. We go through the woods. There they go. Just following. You say, that's a bunch of tame cows. No, no. No, it's just the old bell cow trick. Do you hear what and who God uses the bell cow? It's him or her who has surrendered the me and sings with everything within me. Where he leads, I will follow. Come on, amen. I'll go with him, with him all the way. I'll go through the garden. I'll go to the cross. I'll go through guess I'll, I'll go. Beloved, beloved. To get God to move, to, to turn God loose, to turn the Holy Spirit loose in this place in us so we can go out there and him be turned on through us it's not complicated hard oh yeah because the flesh screams and kicks the entire way that you're making your place to surrender me I'm going to just tell you something count on this if God shows up with an unprecedented outpouring in this church, in this community, in this county, in this country, it will be because people took that path. You cannot fabricate revival. You cannot fabricate revival. I know we can pump up emotion, but you cannot fabricate revival. I know we can stir emotion, but you cannot fabricate revival. It's just God's people in their personal relationship with him, surrendering, repenting of the me, and revering the he. If you'll do that, we'll get to be a bell cow that gets to lead churches and gets to lead communities and gets to lead people to what God is doing in your life. Father, in Jesus' name, I'm going to hush. I've said enough, may have said too much. But I'm hushing. I'm done. I'm finished. And Holy Spirit, I'm listening, and we're listening for you to begin speaking now. In Jesus' name. So here's what I want you to do. We're going to remain seated on this. And I want you to hear the words. I want you to just sit where you are in, re in reverence. Your eyes closed, your heads bowed before God. And this team is going to lead us in a, a powerful, powerful response opportunity and as the Holy Spirit speaks I want you to just come and repent of the me in thee and enthrone the he make him Lord of your life our pew problem is a me problem what was it Denzel Washington said my greatest enemy is the inner me. And beloved, count on that. Abby, would you just lead us? Would you just lead us and, and just as we're not gonna stand, but as you as you just feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you, 